Good evening, everybody. My name is Lisa Smith, and this is Enlightened Conversations with the YWCA of Hanover. Welcome back. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been here, about four weeks. And this evening, we are going to talk about um, the Carlisle Indian School, uh, not too far from us here in uh, Hanover, but uh, seems like a lifetime ago or more in thought as to th why the Indian school existed and what it existed for. To lead us in that conversation, we have with us tonight Kate Timer. Kate has worked as a professional archivist, writer, editor, and speaker, and she is now a project partner with the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center. She is focusing on catalog cataloging the photographs, documents, and publications of the school. She is the author of a book entitled A Very Correct Idea of Our School, A Photographic History of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. That was the official first name of the school. And she's going to explain to us the history of the Indian boarding school movement in the US and how the Carlisle Indian School in particular was a part of that. We have quite a few uh, pictures and, and a great deal of information coming to us from Kate. And I think it's going to raise quite a few questions in folks. So listen up, let's hear what she has to say, and then let's talk about it. Kate, it's all yours. Okay, I like the listen up. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, this uh, normally, when I give talks of this kind, I do focus pretty specifically on Carlisle. But in I've modified this talk a bit to be a little bit more general about the entire boarding school system. And I'm going to share my screen. One moment, please. Okay. Okay, um, this I build this is a very brief introduction because to do to do Carlisle alone justice uh, would take quite a long time, but I just want to give you some of the um, the big picture things about the school. And again, uh, I welcome questions at the end if people want more specifics. This is a photograph. It's actually two photographs sort of stitched together there of the printing department uh, at the school. The school had a newspaper um, from almost the very beginning until the end uh, produced and um, written uh, sort of uh, by students, um, edited by others. Um, but that gives you an idea of what the printing department looked like. I'm going to start by talking about the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center, which I sometimes refer to as the project. Um, this effort started about nine years ago and is um, centered at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Um, they have, uh, over these nine years, they have digitized over a quarter of a million pages of student records, primarily almost exclusively from the National Archives. When Carlisle closed in 1918, the records of the school, which had been maintained at the school, were transferred to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and from there to the National Archives. So, um, if you can, you might not be able to read, but on the left column where it says find, I'm just going to go over the types of information that you can find on this site. Um, student records, every student, not every student, most students had a student file or a student card of some kind. If you look there, you'll see that information. Um, there are over 3,500 images, primarily photographs that um, mostly come from other repositories, and I'm the person who cataloged most of those. Um, Carlel has a very rich photographic history. I think that's rather unique among uh, Indian schools. Publications, I mentioned the student newspapers, which are an amazing source of information. Um, there are over 1,700 publications. Um, that you can read there. The documents are um, 
uh, the project's trying to get through things um, in addition to the student records, records of the Bureau of Indian Affairs itself. And once the National Archives is back open for business and um, we can get the funding together, we're going to try to go down and digitize more because there's a lot more in the Bureau of Indian Affairs that we haven't gotten to. Lists and ledgers, all kinds of detailed information. Um, and then below that, you can see cemetery information, and we are going to talk about the cemetery, but um, there is a cemetery on the grounds at Carlisle and the grounds of the Army uh, War College, which is where, uh, where the school was. And we're going to talk about the cemetery, but uh, the project has done some very good work in trying to pull together all the information about who was buried in the cemetery and where they are now. So when I refer to the site, that's uh, what that is. So why did schools like Carlisle exist? And I'm going to go through this. I'm assuming that we all have a basic understanding of American history. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because um, I think we all understand the issues at play. So we are back. Imagine yourself, we're, we're in post-Civil War America. And people want, white people want to move west. They want land. They want land that Native Americans are on or used to be on. So um, this was called the Indian question, sometimes the Indian problem. And it was a national discussion about essentially what to do with the Indians um, because the the conditions that allowed them to live their lives as they had, had been destroyed. And they were essentially wards of the state or wards of the nation and the government was responsible for caring for them. So the question was, what are we gonna do with these people who we are now responsible for? Um, and the most, uh, by the way, whenever I use a word like civilized, I'm using it Imagine air quotes there for when I use words like civilized. So the most um, humane answer to that question, because of course giving them back their land was never, that was never part of a discussion. It wasn't um, considered, was it? No, this is, we are no. not, that is not happening. So the question isn't how can we restore their lives to what they were, it's what can we do and that was very much what can we do with these people who we are now responsible for? And the, the most, again, the most humane decision approach in the minds of most of the people who were um, active in this area was assimilation and assimilation through education. So you, um, during this time period, as you know, we also have a great many European immigrants coming to this country. And in the same way that when people arrived off the boats, it was like, okay, you got to get rid of your funny clothes, um, get rid of your funny names, stop speaking your own languages, don't cook your own food, um, all that kind of stuff that they felt a great deal of pressure and America wanted them to become like the like, I'm going to use the phrase, regular Americans, right? And so this assimilation applied to Native Americans as well. Um, and uh, I highly recommend um, David Wallace Adams book here, Education for Extin Extinction. This explains the system, um, the, the, uh, the history of the boarding schools, highly recommend this book. So Education became the means for doing this. And I want to emphasize this because I think that when we contemporary Americans hear education, like, okay, educa education's great. Who isn't in favor of education? Well, here's the thing. Don't think of it like Little House on the Prairie learning your ABCs. That was part of it. But a lot of this education was, as, well, as Adam says, education for extinction. It was it was using education as a means to teach Native Americans to become, um, as Luther Standing Bear, who went to Carlisle, uh, he said they wanted to make us into imitation white men. So, and this is something I'm going to be coming back to, that uh, when you hear, you know, schools, when you hear education, sure, 
there's the kind of education that you're accustomed to thinking about, but it is assimilation. It is um, the destruction of their culture in as much as was possible. That was the goal. Make you, make the people who were in these schools as far as was possible into um, model American citizens. And part of that, um, some people may be familiar with this, Tony Kornheiser, sportscaster, um, uses this all the time and I love it because the answer to all your questions is money. As with many things that happen in American history, if you wanna say, why did this happen? Money, money, be, you know, again, basically the land, we all know about that. Um, white people wanted the land. If there was anything good on the land, they wanted that land and they would um, send Native Americans to go somewhere else. But um, in another way, and they also, um, there, was an, there was a great emphasis on, on um, getting the Native Americans to be financially self-sufficient so that the government did not have to pay for their upkeep. Again, in this wards of the, wards of the state thing, um, you know, the government would send rations to the reservations, et cetera. So the idea was we need to get them to be taxpayers and not um, as it was considered a burden on the tax, on the other taxpayers. So, um, and also part of the assimilation project agenda, um, along with Christianizing people was to teach them to, to, to inculcate into them the, that sort of uh, Protestant work ethic idea of working for money um, and also the idea that you want to get, you always want more money. So in many cultures, the idea is, you know, you work, you get what you need to take care of yourself, to take care of your family. And that that's okay. You know, you, why would I work more? I've got, everybody's taken care of. That's not the way it works. They want you to learn how to work for money, how to save money, how to manage money, and how to want more money. I need a bigger house. I need more things. Um, again, to become part of this American culture of consumption. So a lot of what is being taught is, is a lot of what is doing is the unteaching of um, any particular culture's approach to that. And this just really, um, I'm gonna use the word brainwashing, to, to into this culture of work, 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 work harder, money, 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 save your money. Um, it, it comes up all the time. So um, I encourage you to use this quote freely in, in many, it comes in handy in many instances. Okay, so what was the Carlisle School? And the Carlisle, it is the, was the first federally managed off-reservation boarding school. So it was not the first federally managed school. It's not the first off-reservation boarding school. It's not the first boarding school, which many people think it was the first boarding school. It was not. There were, there were um, 48 boarding schools in existence in 1877, which was two years before Carlisle was founded. So I will talk, um, or it's a non-systematic, there is no system. You know, we can use the phrase, the boarding school system, it really wasn't a system. They, at one point, they sort of tried to make it into one and it was, I'm talking about in the United States. So you had boarding schools on reservations, you had day schools, you know, people live at home and go to school. Um, some Native Americans went to public schools along, alongside white um, children. Um, and these were run by missions, by religious organizations, by private groups, by states, by contractors, by the federal government. So there's a lot going on here, um, which makes it very difficult to really get a handle on how many, how many schools there were. Um, and this is something that um, Secretary of the Interior, Deborah Holland, um, launched an effort last June to um, identify, just, just identify all the boarding schools in the United States. And then as part of that, to find out where their records are. And as you can imagine from this non-systematic system, that's not a trivial thing. Um, 
specific, you know, you've got these religious ones, private ones. So um, she's trying to get a handle on <laughs> how many people, how many Native Americans were in boarding schools and all those kinds of statistics. Um, you may have heard stories about the um, very uh, horrible um, uh, discoveries in Canada related to their boarding schools. Um, they have a different system. They have a much more systematic system. My understanding, I could be mistaken, is that uh, what the government did is it, it really sort of turned over responsibility for all the boarding schools to religious organizations. Um, and um, my um, personal conjecture, I very well, I could be wrong, um, is I think that uh, we are not going to find the kinds of um, abuses that happened in Canada, in the United States, because despite the fact that our system is, is you know, confusing, um, the government, our government kept its eye on most of these schools. So I don't think we're going to find, in Canada, they're founding, you know, mass graves on former boarding school locations. I don't think we're going to find that in this country. Could be wrong. But anyway, so when we talk about the boarding school system, I just want to get across that there were lots of different kinds organized by different people, run by different people. Um, so it's not, um, I will refer to it as a system, and it's really not. So why was there an Indian school at Carlisle? Oh my goodness, this man. <clears throat> we could do a lot, I could spend a lot of time on this man. This is Richard Henry Pratt, uh, famous and infamous. Um, I like this picture of him because I think this gets across his character. Um, he was a military person. Uh, he served in the Civil War as a very, very young man. He, after the war was over, he tried civilian life and it did not work for him. And I'm not surprised. Uh, so he re-enrolled in the military and he fought, um, he fought against uh, Indians on the plains and he fought with Indians as his, um, on, on his side as uh, translators and scouts and so forth. So he, he, he has got a memoir. You can read it if you want. Um, he felt that he had a good understanding of, of Native Americans. Um, and so in 18, 1875, he was put in charge of a group of prisoners of war. These are adult men. And uh, he took them to Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida, very, very far away from their families intentionally, of course. And he was, you know, their jailer. And he knew that they were going to be there for years. And so um, he decided to take steps to, I'm going to use the word civilize, put the quotation marks around it. So he, you know, cut their hair. He got them out of their native clothing and put them into surplus army uniforms, which is what he had access to. In St. Augustine, there were many um, rich white people who were summering, uh, wintering there from the north. And so there were a lot of uh, rich white ladies, Christian ladies, Quaker ladies, who came in and um, helped teach uh, the prisoners English, reading, writing, and of course, Christianity. Christianity goes through everything. Um, I'm, it's just, it's, it's woven into the fabric of this whole endeavor is to convert people to Christianity. And these so, prisoners were, by and large, Native Americans? Oh, they were all Native Americans, yeah. Okay. All right. They were all, all. All Indian prisoners of war. I'm going to use Indian and Native American um, interchangeably. Okay. So these are, these are adult men. So he's there. He has them there for three years. And, um, of course, he also teaches them to or encourages them to do things that will earn money. Another part of it, of course. So by the end, you know, they're coming and going. They're, they're interacting with the people of St. Augustine. Um, they are considered very um, civilized by the white people who meet them. So uh, Pratt gets some press for this, and he gets a taste of success and a taste of minor fame and rubbing elbows with uh, his social betters and people with money. So when the time comes when the government says, you know, the prisoners can go home, 
there's a small group of them who say, we'd like to stay East and continue our education. And so Pratt helps arrange for them to go to the Hampton School in Virginia, which is a school for um, the children of former slaves. It was the only place that would take them. Um, so Pratt and his small group of, of Indian students go there. And so Pratt then sees a model of how the Hampton School is run. But as, um, as my, my slide says, he is ambitious. Well, well, he is also Methodist and he is difficult. So he doesn't want to be working underneath anybody else. He wants his own school. He's got a vision. He is an egotist. Uh, the reason I have Methodist in there is because he is a religious man. Um, he believes that Christianity is a wonderful thing and that it is wonderful for Native Americans to, to convert to Christianity. But he believes in he believes in himself, he believes in his mission, he believes he is doing the right thing by trying to um, lift up and, and help Native Americans compete in the environment in which they now find themselves. Um, so he finds, he knows that there's an unused army facility in Carlisle, former barracks, now not being used for anything. And he likes this location. It's here, it's out east. Um, it's away from, uh, I believe the pernicious influences was a phrase that was used. So you wanna get people away from their families, away from their communities, break those ties. Um, it's also here in good farmland. Um, there are Quakers around, good religious people. Anyway, he sees this as a really good location. So that is why the Carlisle Indian School is in Carlisle. Opened in 1879, closed in 1918, 39 years, and Pratt was in charge for 25 of those years. So he really puts his stamp on the school. And after he leaves, I don't have time to talk about it, but after he leaves, things go downhill. Um, we can talk about that too, but it's really Pratt's school. I mean, he's, he's working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. He is part, uh, he's a government employee, um, but it's his school. Who attended? Uh, this is a famous photo. You may have seen it before. Um, I'm sure you may see it in the future and now you'll know the context for it. Um, we call this, um, we refer to this one as the Sea of Faces because that's really what it is. This photo was taken in 1884 on the grounds of the school. It's now the um, Army War College. Um, that building is still there. That's the superintendent's house. You can go to the grounds and you can basically have this same view. Uh, our best estimate at the current time is that there are around 7,800 um, people who attended the school over those 39 years. As you can see, there are both male and female students. That was very important to Pratt and indeed to the in everybody who was running boarding schools. You had to have, um, you had to educate the girls. You had to educate the girls because they were gonna become the mothers. You had to get the next generation. And this is partly why they wanted to um, educate young people and they weren't really focusing on educating adults because you know it's kind of too late. As far as they're concerned, it's too late with, for them, right? Get them while they're young. So you want to get the next generation, you want to get the mothers, you want to get the people who are going to influence the next generation, always boys and girls, always male and female students. The average age, um, I try not to call them boys and girls or children, um, because many of them were, were older. The average age is 16.7 for uh, male students and 15.2 for female students, again, over the entire history of the school. They tried not to take students under 12 years old. Um, of course, there were, there were certainly younger students, particularly in the early days. And when you see pictures like this one, this is the one that gets used a lot, um, the, younger, the younger students are in the front. So they are the ones that you see. Um, the taller students are in the back. Um, the, the, the guys who are 20 years old, um, you're not seeing them as much. Um, but again, th these are the people who came to the school, and there were people from virtually every nation, every tribal nation in the United States, including Alaska, uh, nobody from Hawaii. So it is really pulling from all over the country and bringing together people from uh, different nations. 
Were there other schools like Carlisle? Like uh, almost every question, the answer is yes and no. So yes, after Carlisle, there were other government operated off reservation boarding schools. Here are some of them. By 1909, there were 27 of these kinds of schools, again, off reservation boarding schools in existence. However, here's your map. There's Carlisle number one, there's all the other ones. So um, it was expensive. Uh, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs paid for the transportation for students to come to school and to go home. And the Bureau uh, was not wanting to spend more money than it absolutely had to. So they, after Carlisle, they preferred to have schools that were closer to um, the reservations so that transportation costs would be, would be decreased. Um, so they were no schools that were out here. You can see there's one in Michigan. And these other off-reservation boarding schools were not like Carlisle because they did not have Richard Henry Pratt. I like this picture of him looking grumpy on the stairs. Uh, this is taken very early in the history of the school, 1880. There's um, Spotted Tail, um, a chief who had children at the school. And these three, and they are always called the Quaker ladies. They are from Philadelphia and they gave money. And that it, Pratt worked very, very hard to get more money because um, he's the Bureau of Indian Affairs, as I said, did not want to spend money. And he wanted, um, he wanted his students to have every advantage and he worked hard and he was successful. He promoted the hell out of Carlisle. He wanted to make sure everybody knew about it and that everybody thought it was great. So um, we'll come back to these Quaker ladies, but again, this was, this was a big part of, I think why other schools weren't like Carlisle. How did students end up at the school in the early days? And I know you can't read this, but this just gives you a sort of an idea. So in the very earliest times, um, Pratt and other school employees would, would travel west, go to um, tribal communities, talk to the parents and convince them that it was in their best interests and the interests of their children to attend this school and that he would take care of their children. Um, very, I think rather quickly within like a year or two, um, Pratt certainly wasn't going west. And I think it sort of tapered off of other school employees. So they were relying on the Indian agents, again, who work for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, would, would get together um, groups of young people to come. You can see this is a list, we got like nine people. So they would pull together groups and then they would um, you know, get on a train and come. This, uh, that sort of model transformed into a more individual one. Uh, I think this is in like the mid 1890s, we actually start getting these individual applications. Um, again, you can't read this, but there's a, por there's a part on here where the parent or guardian has to sign saying that they are giving permission for their, for their um, for this person to come to school. There's also a physician's certificate where somebody um, at the point of departure at the reservation or whatever has to sign and say that this person is in good enough physical health to come to come to school. And Pratt was extremely insistent on only trying to take students who were in good health. Um, it was a school, not a hospital. Um, they did have medical facilities, but they were not set up to have people stay for long periods of time. So he did not want to have people come in knowing that they were sick. Um, and this is, um, you will hear stories and they are true of children being, young children being taken from their families, from their mothers, um, taken and sent to school. Um, and this certainly did happen. We don't think that this happened with students who were coming to Carlisle, maybe exceptions, of course. But again, because of the expense of that long train journey, um, we don't think that that kind of um, action was happening that was much more likely to have happened 
uh, on the reservations when um, education became compulsory and the agents were responsible for making sure that all the children that they were responsible for went to school. So again, day schools, on reservation boarding schools, it's much more likely that I mean, those events happened, I'm not saying they didn't happen, but that they would happen with those, those other kinds of schools. Um, and again, you have this application form, somebody has to sign and say they're giving permission. I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that anything about how those signatures were obtained, there may have been other things, there may have been events that were not on the up and up. Okay, but anyway, there was an application process. Uh, um, it was, the name of the school was an industrial school and Carlisle, like basically, I think almost all the Ind Indian schools had both an academic and an industrial component because you remember they were being educated to work, right? So the academics, um, this is an early picture, although I think there are only male students in here, but there were always male and female students uh, mixed together in classrooms. So again, early days, reading, writing, arithmetic, um, uh, as students came who had more previous education, which became a requirement at one point, um, they wouldn't have to do these more uh, sort of basic education, but they would teach, you know, history, the white people's version of history, which is kind of fascinating in and of itself, the way they were teaching Native Americans their own version of, of history, geography, um, mathematics, sciences, etc. So it was, it, they were getting an academic education. This is from 1901. I like this one, experiments in physics. You can see male and female students together. Um, people who were more academically inclined, more interested, more capable, could take more advanced classes. Um, that was always there and encouraged for those who um, who wanted to go that route. And in, uh, this is 1890, and this is the first graduating class. Um, there were about 780 graduates, um, again, out of about 7,800 um, students. And, and the low graduation rate is sometimes pointed to as a criticism of Carlisle. But again, um, if you're familiar with this time period, you know, that wasn't the point. I mean, Pratt never graduated from high school himself. Um, you would stop going to school when you needed to. If you were, if this wasn't the kind of path you wanted to, you didn't graduate. You know, you would, you would learn your, your trade as much as you needed to know. And then you would go. But again, it, it was an option for those who wanted to go this way. Um, so there were, and, and those who were academically inclined, you know, went, some of them went on and, and pursued other degrees and things of that kind. Uh, the other half is industrial vocational training uh, for the female students, of course, this is learning how to be a good wife and mother, isn't it? Um, so cooking, cleaning, laundry, sewing, all that stuff, domestic arts, um, the, uh, the careers that were open to women at that time, were limited, included nursing and um, being school teachers. And the school also had options for training um, female students in those as well. And for male students, this is 1880, and that's Pratt himself back there in that sort of pilgrim looking hat. That's him. He actually learned, uh, this is the tin, the tin shop, and he actually learned the trade of tin smithing as a young man. So he I guess was feeling comfortable hanging out in the tin shop. So you had these kind of manual trades. Um, farming was huge. The, the school had farmland and um, many of the students worked on the farms learning how to farm in the European style. Um, and the, the, the produce from the farms was consumed by the students at the school and in some cases also sold. But the idea in many ways were, was for the school to be self-sustaining. This is the shoe shop. So again, they would once, once the school was up and running, they would try to make their own shoes, make their own clothes, um, grow their own food, et cetera. But again, remember, they were also learning how to be a white person. So um, this is calisthenics in the gymnasium. 
So a lot of what they were learning is, a, is this is like how to sit, how to stand, how to do things in unison, how to do things according to a clock, how to do things on a schedule. Um, all of the, and again, remember, we are talking about the late 19th century sort of Victorian kind of uptight environment. So they were learning things like that. They were learning um, the school was organized into in a sort of a military fashion with battalions, you know, sort of ways to organize the students into groups and they would march and they would drill. So again, um, that's very important. We don't really have much time to go into everyday life, but uh, I just wanted to show you this is a this is a real uniform which has been donated to the Smithsonian. It was worn by a student. We know who wore it. So again, think about that kind of military discipline environment. This is the dining hall. Uh, you can see that male and female students are together but separate, opposite sides of the table. Um, and learning how to interact, how a gentleman interacts with a lady was part of this kind of uh, manners were very important, again, for them to learn. Um, they did, male and female students did see each other. Um, they slept in separate dorms, of course, but they were together in the classroom and in other places. This is the chapel. It's the first purpose built building on the campus. Um, they needed a space big enough for every all the students to gather in one place and they didn't exist but um, religion was a big part of course of everything. Um, Sunday mornings, the male students would go out into the town of Carlisle to attend the local churches to attend Sunday school. Um, they would go to whatever denomination they were part of or had been assigned, which is another story. Talk about that. But and again, this is more of this again interacting with the white people. How do people behave? You know what a church service is like. You learn how to stand, how to sit, how to be quiet, all that kind of stuff. Um, and in the afternoon, um, the entire school would come back and have a, a joint service together um, in the chapel. I think the girls didn't go out because they didn't want them to be um, exposed to whatever, ill influences that young ladies should not be exposed to. Um, however, I think later in the, in the history of the school, they did. There were clubs, YMC, this is the YMCA. Um, there were a lot of clubs. Um, this is the Susan Longstreth uh, Literary Society meeting. The women, also, the female students also had clubs. Um, I mentioned um, her name because this is one of the Quaker ladies and she, they named things after her. She was important in the history of the school. But again, these are these are all very um, showing this. You know, students had bicycles. Um, this is the school band, which was hugely important. It marched at all these pre presidential inaugurations. This is the band in Long Branch, New Jersey, where they went. They spent the summer there. They were sort of the band in residence. But again, if you're familiar with this period in American history, these are all these sort of standard middle class things, clubs bands, singing. Um, Pratt wanted his students to have all of these kind of, again, white people experiences. Um, and, and they did. And there's football. Um, probably you know about the Carlisle football team. Uh, it was huge. It was nationally famous. Um, they played the best Ivy League teams and often they beat them. They had national news coverage. This was a point of pride for the rest of the students. The whole school was very proud of the football team and um, many Native Americans throughout the country were proud of this football team. They were called the, the, the Carlisle Indians was the name of the team and they were beating the white teams. And so um, football was, very important uh, at the school and a big part of the prominence of the school um, at a national level and among Native Americans as well, because it was a point, the football was a point of pride. Outings were another thing that um, uh, other schools did, but um, I think, we think Pratt kind of invented it. So think of an outing. Um, so what would happen is students would, there was no school in the summertime, so they would go out and stay 
and work in the homes of, you know, pre-screened, pre-selected families. Um, and, you know, kind of think of it like maybe an internship or a study abroad program. So the purpose was that, um, that the students, I'm gonna to switch to this one. Uh, this is some Carlisle Indian girls in their country homes. So they were, you know, the girls were, you know, doing domestic work, taking care of children, laundry, cleaning, all that stuff. But again, look at them. They're learning how to be civilized white ladies. How do we act? How do we stand? How do, we, how do, how do families talk to each other? Because a school is a very artificial environment. So um, again, this is part of Pratt's whole thing of teaching them how to live like white people, how to think like white people, how to be like white people. So um, that was the purpose of the outings. And um, they, they were, in most cases, they were paid when they went outings. That was usually in the summer times. Um, students could go back and often did go back to the same families year after year. And many of them developed close relationships, as you might expect, as study abroad students often do with their host families. Um, and some students would stay uh, longer than the summer. If they did, they were required to attend the local public school. And we have... Um, we have stories about people remembering that they there were Carlisle students in the schoolroom next to them. So that's kind of interesting. But the outing program is is was a big part of Carlisle and Pratt thought it was very important. Did the students see their families? Answer to all your questions is yes and no. Um, especially in the early days, many chiefs and dignitaries visited the school. It's very close to Washington, D.C., relatively speaking, and a lot of the chiefs would come to D.C. to conduct business. They would go up to Carlisle. They would see their own family members. Some of them would be sort of looking at the school to see if they thought, you know, is this okay for me to send my people to? Um, so that would happen. And of course, um, a lot of the Many of the students who came, came with other family members, um, either at the same time or sequentially, people would send um, other family members there. So they did, they did see people they knew. Um, however, the Bureau did not want to, again, the Bureau paid for one train ticket to and one train ticket back. If you wanted to come, if you wanted to go home again, it's on your dime. And so later on in the course of the school, as more students had access to more funds, um, things loosened up and students were able to go back, especially if there was a family illness or a death in the family. Um, it was much more likely that they would be allowed to go home then. Problems. Well, I love this picture. Um, remember the average age. You're going to have, eh, you can have problems with people this age. So, the, you know, the, you can think about this in the, the terms, the kinds of problems that that people of this age at any boarding school would have. Yes, there's, they're gonna be homesick. In this case, they're gonna be a different kind of homesick because um, they're homesick for their culture, their, their way of life, their language in many cases. Um, the whole world, for some of them, the whole world they were entering was extremely different from what they were used to. Um, uh, so there was homesickness, there were disciplinary issues. Um, of course, uh, you had um, interactions with male, female, male and female students that were not sanctioned, so that becomes a problem. There's alcohol, of course, young men get access to alcohol. So you get all the normal problems. Um, again, the ones that are unique to a school of this kind um, are not in some in at certain periods of time, they were not allowed to speak their native languages. And again, this remembering that the point of the school was to break their connections with their native cultures, at least um, at the very early stages uh, when people still had connections to their native cultures. Um, so that's very that can be very um, painful for many students. Mm -hmm. um, they also, of course, got sick. Uh, the school always had medical facilities. It had a hospital. This is a bright, shiny picture taken to promote how, the efficiency of their hospital. But in uh, the, the medical treatment they got was, let's just say, as good as anybody else at the time period was getting. Tuberculosis and infectious diseases were um, the primary cause of death. And of course, there was no cure for tuberculosis, which I think was the number one killer of people in the United States, if not around the world. I mentioned the cemetery. Um, there were, were 
I think we're pretty sure about the number 234. It's somewhere around there. Um, deaths of current students, uh, people who were enrolled. There are about 192 students in the cemetery. I'm quibbling because there are there are other Native American people who are buried in the cemetery, and we can get into that. The cemetery was moved. Um, as you may know, it was originally in one place. Uh, after the school closed and the army took the property back over, they wanted to build something. So they moved the cemetery to its present location, which you may have seen. Um, there have been, um, the army has quite recently allowed uh, native people to um, bring their uh, relatives home. They, for a long time, they wouldn't do that. 21, uh, the remains of 21 people have been removed from the cemetery and returned to their home communities. Uh, there's a documentary film, there's a screening of that this week in Carlisle, and I think it's going to be on PBS on um, 23rd. Uh, 23rd, okay, but anyway, that's about one of those, one of those stories. Carlisle did close in 1918. Why? Well, it's time it passed. Remember how it started. By 1918, really wasn't needed anymore. Uh, the Bureau had been looking for an excuse to close it because it's expensive, it's not really needed. You know, Pratt was long gone. There was no champion to, to try to keep it open. And look at the time period, the Army wanted it um, to have, serve as a hospital um, for um, uh, veterans returning from World War I. So that's why it closed. Pratt's legacy. Well, here's the thing. Be careful what you wish for. Pratt wanted everybody to know about Carlisle, and he wanted everybody to know that he was the man behind Carlisle, and he wanted everybody to know that he was the one who was responsible for... There's a biography that was called The Red Man's Moses, and that's the kind of image he had for himself. Yeah, I know. Anyway, so he got what he wanted. Um, every, everybody who knows about the boarding schools knows Richard Henry Pratt and not in a good way. Um, Pratt is famous for a phrase we don't think he used very often, uh, kill the Indian, save the man. And that soundbite is attached to him forever. So he wanted fame and he got it, but not in the way that I think he would like. So um, if you want to learn more, read a book. Uh, again, uh, the, this one, Education for Extinction, is really good. If you want to know about the whole, all the boarding schools, read that book. Um, get it on Amazon. If you want to know about Carlisle, I suggest you read my book, also available on Amazon. Um, it's, I, I call it a photographic history. It's a history with a lot of photos. Uh, and I particularly like that on the cover. <laughs> I, I think the, the facial expressions of those people um, uh, convey a lot of emotion, I think, mm -hmm. and you can, you can read into them what a, a, a very correct idea of our school is a quote from a student. So I recommend that, um, and I will take your questions. Uh, also with us is um, Jim Gorenzer, who's the director of the Digital Resource Center. He's just sort of lurking in the background. So if there's anything I can't handle, he's going to chime in. Okay. okay, great. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. And I see that Lou is back. So we have some <laughs> questions from our viewers. And then I've got a, a quite a few of them jotted down here, too. I think we're going to keep you busy for a while. All right. Well, let's see what our viewers have to say first. Okay. Uh, this question, okay, Did do we know of... <clears throat> any students that settled in the area or didn't leave after the closure? Good question. Any, any students oh, yeah. settle, let's say, in Carlisle? Yes. I'm looking, I'm looking at you, Jim. Definitely, we know of one. Um, I think there were others, many, not, not necessarily in Carlisle. But again, um, when students went on these outings with local families, often with farms, um, sometimes they would, you know, they'd get close to the families, they'd just stay, they'd keep working on the farm, they'd stay local. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, okay. I don't want to go into any two details or we'll be here online. Okay. Now you, you showed us two books and there is yeah. a question here about memoirs of survivors. Luther Standing Bear, 
um, look for Luther Standing Bear. I think it's My People, The Sioux is specifically um, a memoir about and includes his time in Carlisle. He was one of the first students. And um, there aren't very many others. There are a couple others of students, but they really don't talk very much about Carlisle. Gotcha. Um, so Luther Standing Bear, he's one of the first students. So his experience is not typical, but it is very uh, memorable. Um, and he had a very interesting life, so. Okay. So you, we were talking about how um, this question came in when we were talking about how um, Pat would go out and, and recruits, re recruit yes. students. Yes, yeah, exactly. So the question is, is, is there any evidence that some students were taken to the school against their will or their family's wishes? We have no well, certainly not against their family's wishes. Um, what may have transpired between a child and their parents, you know, the child might not have wanted to go, but the parents wanted the child to go. So, you know, you know how that goes. But we don't have any evidence of, of, of that. On the other hand, um, this is not an equal playing field. So when Pratt and, and the people who came after him are making the case of, you know, it'll be good for you to send your child. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of ways that pressure could have been applied, a lot of different ways. But so, nothing, you know- Nothing documented. Nothing documented. Um, not saying it didn't, not saying it didn't happen. Right. Never say that. And, and maybe this is an opinion and I'm not sure. Um, how sure are we um, that the school wasn't more of a money-making venture than well, anything else. Well, we have, we have the financial ledgers. Um, they weren't make, let's put it this way. They weren't, okay, maybe back up. The school under Pratt, um, again, school under Pratt is different from the school after Pratt. Um, they weren't making money. I mean, any money that came in under Pratt was put back into the school. Um, at one point late in Pratt's tenure, uh, they did an audit because they wanted to see if there'd been financial mismanagement. Couldn't, none. He was, he's squeaky clean. A lot to answer for Pratt. Um, mismanagement of money is not one of his things. On the other hand, after Pratt left, um, one of the superintendents, Moses Friedman, um, he's a shady character. And um, there's evidence there was an investigation of him and he was, I, I think you can just say skimming money um, from different places. So he definitely, there was some shady financial stuff going on under his tenure. Um, but um, there was never enough. And, and again, that was during the height of the football team. So when the football team was, was super popular, there's lots of money kicking around. <laughs> so that's when you had shady stuff going on um and there was a whole senate investigation and you can it's like a very thick report and you can read all about it but yeah that's uh, other than that under pratt no um after especially with football money there was some shady go, stuff go, go figure i'm just yeah. saying um the last exports in money right? I, I don't well, know well again see how they go together. and um you know the athletes just to continue with you i mean uh, from what we hear the, I mean, the athletes lived in a different dorm. They had a different dining room. It was well known that they were sneaking out at night to go into town to have fun. You know, um, something's like don't a change. typical high school. So, yeah, I know. I'm just saying, some things don't yeah. change. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and then just just to clarify, this last question I have here, uh, just to clarify from my mind, the the school, if I understood your presentation, school was basically funded by the Department of the Interior. Yes. With, with additional funds coming from donors or supporters from, from rich um, Quaker families. Yes, um, the school, and this is the way it worked for all this, my understanding is how it worked for all the schools. Um, you, every school would get a certain amount of money 
basically, you know, per head. So you had to account for how many students you had and how long they were there. Pratt negotiated a different rate, um, uh, a different daily rate for their rations. He got more money. Uh, he was able to negotiate to get higher money for the rations. I think that's, that's another reason why Carlisle was a little different. But yeah, um, they also got some money from selling things like, you know, again, with this farms and stuff and the tinsmithing and they would make carriages. But, you know, we're not talking about a lot there. So yeah, it's mostly from the, directly from the Bureau and whatever Pratt raised. Okay. I think that's all the questions I have for now. Kate, you referred to some of the, the students that were there by their Indian names. Were they forced to give up those names and adopt more English names or Americanized names? Um, in the, I will give you my understanding of this, um, particularly in the first students, and, and you'll hear uh, Luther Standing Bear, I think, has an account of this. Um, in the early days of the school, student, many, some students arrived without any um, America, uh, Anglo name. And mm -hmm. um, when, when I was reading about this, I was just thinking about the stories you hear about people coming to Ellis Island. And they're like, well, I can't pronounce that. So we're going to call you we'll so call and so. You this. Yeah. Right. Um, so they had a school name, often the school, and you can see this in the records, um, the school would, would still write down their Indian name because they needed to keep track of this person. And it's, um, and over time, uh, you know, more and more students arrived and it wasn't necessary for the school to do that. That had been done previously. So they were arriving with a name, how that was, how they acquired that name, I don't know. But certainly, yes, in the early days, um, there were, uh, you know, points at the blackboard and that's your name now. Um, but that was less and less common over time as students arrived right. with, yeah. with, again, uh, pronounceable names. As Again, think of Ellis Island. It's like, well, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what to do with that name. I'm going to call you Joe. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. And that yeah. happened frequently, or the name would be truncated because they couldn't pronounce all of the syllables. So suddenly your name is only this long when it used to be this long, you know? Um, yeah. Or, or yeah. you know, um, yeah. Yeah, they kind of basically yes, yeah. right, yeah. How how accepted were the students when they went out into the town? I'm thinking of of uh, back in the the 60s with the, the students of color um, integrating schools. Now we have these students of native background trying to integrate the town, um, and this was a hundred years before the time of the civil rights era. How did that go? Oh, well, um, in a way, we don't know. Um, okay. Uh, in a way, we don't know because I'm relying on the testimony of the, the school newspapers and also of the commercial newspapers, the car local Carlisle town newspapers, mm -hmm. um, which for the most part are kind of booster-ish. You know, they're, they're mostly, the, the school brought money to the town. Right. So the town, you know, the, the sort of town fathers and, you know, we're all in favor because there's there's, you know, the barracks had been empty and now there's a source of revenue for the town in the school. So there was a certain um, I get the vibe um, that the newspapers wanted to make sure everything was rosy <laughs> about okay. the situation. Yeah. Um, but also. Um, uh, my impression is also that the Native Americans were, you know, very. Um, I'm going to use the word exotic. There weren't a lot of Native Americans left in Pennsylvania. So mm -hmm. many people really hadn't seen that many. Um, there certainly are stories of there being friction. Um, it wasn't all rosy, but I think for the most part, it probably went okay. Uh, Jim, do you have anything to add to that? Or are you just going to sit there silent? No, I'll, I'll add. Okay. Uh, I mean, I you definitely see, if you think about racial relations, um, I think the local African American community was less favorably treated by the white community of Carlisle than the Carlisle Indian School students. There definitely seemed to be a difference there. And it may be because 
the African American community is actually living in the town. There are whole families living in the town. And so you see things written about even by the superintendents talking about, um, you know, the African American element in the town of Carlisle as uh, somehow being lesser than than the Native American students. So, mm -hmm. so racism is definitely there and uh, almost in the way that, you know, the Native Americans are, um, you know, from the, if you're a townsperson in Carlisle, you see the Native American uh, in an environment where they're trying to better themselves and trying to lift themselves out of their situation. And, and as Kate said, they're more exotic too. And they're not a threat in, in a way that a, a white person living in town might consider an African-American um, to be someone who threatens their way of life because they live there all the time. Ah, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the, the, the- Very the, interesting. Yeah, the, the sort of ways that people are addressed. And in, in many, in a, just in a, to simplify race, to simplify racism, the hierarchy for in a, a lot of people's minds was white people on top, of course, but Native Americans above black people. And you wow. were still, yeah, we're kind of getting that kind of noble savage thing. Yeah. You know, because you know that so it's all very complicated and that's not the case all the time but yeah no it wasn't all rosy but um yeah. but yeah i think jim it's i think that the issue of whether or not somebody's a threat is an important one how were these students accepted then when they went home they you know <laughs> they finished their education or went as far as they chose to yeah um how did mom and pop and the aunts and uncles take okay here you come back now with your fancy clothes and your different name and you don't sound like us and yeah were they yeah, accepted exa back um that's i'll give my answer and then jim can give his and and the characterization you just made is is true in many cases there were difficult were a lot of difficulties uh you think you're better than us now um mm -hmm. in some cases they've been sort of trained like let's just say something like tinsmithing or something it's like well you get back and you don't you know i got no place to tinsmith here there's no right. you know you've trained me for something and i can't do it i can't um, do it here pratt in many ways um and jim can probably echo this pratt did not want people to go back to their home communities um his idea was much more that he wanted Native Americans to not live in these enclaves unto themselves. He wanted them to spread out and assimilate by just moving in amongst the white people, just we're all living together. Pratt had no, as far as we can tell, no objection to um, uh, Native Americans and white people marrying. Um, that happened pretty often. And he seemed to, black people, different issue. But, um, yeah, he, his idea, and that happened with a lot of Native Americans who did not go back to their home communities. Some people got jobs within the Bureau of Indian Affairs at other Indian schools. So they, they went back, but they were inside, you know, the inside. structure. This, yeah. Um, so yeah, there was tension. Um, sometimes they went back and things were fine. Um, Jim, is that about it? Yeah. Um, right now, I'm just finishing up um, a book by Michael Coleman where um, he examined a lot of memoirs of students who went to all kinds of different boarding schools. And so it all, it all does depend. There are many who had the kind of experience of not really fitting in when they went back to their home communities. Um, you had others who never fully adopted the white man's way, if you will, and um, mm -hmm. comfortable back home. So it's a very mixed bag um, for sure, but um, no doubt there were a lot of difficult transitions because it's, I mean, it's a huge culture shock. I mean, some of the students who were at the boarding schools were there for as long as 10 years. So, right you know, they, they go back home and they don't even know their families. Um, so, so the separation can be really devastating for some families. Mm -hmm. Well, and with communication, the way it was at that time frame, um, you know, you couldn't um, 
keep up with what was going on. You could easily go back and find out that a parent had died or, you know, something drastic had occurred in those 10 years and you were not informed because, you know, it was not that easy to keep in touch. So well, they did, there were extensive letters, letters back mm -hmm. and forth. Um, and also people would share verbally um, news from their home communities. Right. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was extremely disruptive um, to the family unit. And it, uh, we don't have time to get into all the ways that the boarding school system was destructive. Um, but that's, but yeah, I mean, yeah, sounds it, like that was Pratt's goal, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, and, and yeah. to disrupt that that system, the, but the the civilization and the family unit of the Native American that was really what Pratt was looking to destroy. Well, not the fa uh, not the families. I I'll give him credit for that. I would say that. In the Native American community, the family unit is not the nuclear family. So right. it's the larger, the tribe. Exactly. It's they're very communal. And so their their extended families are as close as as a nuclear family. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, but again, as Kate had mentioned, Pratt's idea was that you wouldn't go home again at all. I mean, he wanted the reservation system to disappear. He thought in a matter of a generation or two, everybody would just move into the cities or, or towns and live with white people and, and the reservations would die off. They wouldn't be needed. Huh? Right, um, and, yeah. and sort of odd that he seemed to think that they would, that all these people would be able to just completely abandon their families in that way. I mean, he seemed to discount any kind of emotional attachment to people's own families. Um, but well, that yeah. was his idea. Yeah, that, that's, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. It's also, it, it was really illuminating, Kate, to hear the story of the Carlisle Indian School as compared, <clears throat> excuse me, as compared to some of the other Indian schools, because I've been reading memoirs and books from survivors, and, and I use that term deliberately, survivors of other schools further west, and they paint a not so rosy picture, which is a topic for a whole other evening. But I was pleased to hear that at least in Carlisle, it was not as drastic. Uh, it, it sounded like his goal was was maybe misguided, but but um, a little more positive. Well, um, on on the scale of horrible things, um, I mean, the whole endeavor is very. Um, uh, it, it, you know, very, very, I mean, again, and, and this is something I, I'm working on how to articulate, obviously, because sometimes I have trouble, but, you know, it's very uh, pernicious, I think is the word I mean, I mean, because, you know, you're like, oh, well, it doesn't look so bad. Look, he's got a bicycle. They've got a band. This is all fine. Yeah, but what's the part of it? Again, yeah. so, so again, so, you know, that's, it's, it's difficult because I do want to convey that, you know, yeah, there were these things and, and, many students were often happy but you know again on the scale of of what i mean um they thought coming to carlisle was was a good option for them they were happy with it, some students some students you know but that's because they you know think of the situation they found themselves in right um where this and again we've we've talked to jim and i have talked about this about um you know if you're a mother and you have a child and you decide that your best option is to send this child away. What kind of a situation are you in that you, that that's the decision that you make? Um, it's almost yeah, like it's, it's the lesser of all evils. It, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, right. And it's um, again, there are 7,800 students are 7,800 stories um, over time. The situation that the, that the, um, 
people are coming from differs a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, over time, it, Carlisle becomes much more of, I kind of refer to as a, as a finishing school. Um, you know, the students who are there are self-selecting. I want to go to Carlisle because it's famous. You know, right? the football team has made it famous. Right. So I want to come to this. This is like the best school. <clears throat> so, you know, for those people, they chose it. They wanted to, this is the track they're on. Um, for those people, you know, they're joining the clubs, they're having a bike, it's all great. Not everybody had that experience, right. but yeah, it's all very, even, even if you, if you say, well, this doesn't look that bad. It's like, it doesn't, but let's but underneath. What let's is it? Think about yeah. what's going on here. So, right. Right. Yeah. 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 Oh, one last question. Was there at, at this point in time in history, was there any thought that what we are doing at the very basic level, trying to extinguish this culture and discount everything that Native American people were and what they stood for and what they've practiced and believed, was there at any point the thought expressed that what we're doing is wrong? Well, that it should be yeah. appreciated and, and exactly. Embraced. So, so the turning point, and and I'm, I'm, in, I'm educating myself about this as well. So again, it's the idea of when does something stop being a threat? So okay. at a certain point, um, you know, the the Native American culture has to be destroyed because it's a threat to us. But then when it's when people are like, oh, wait a minute. There's this, again, this sort of noble savage, this dying, you know, then people are like, oh, wait a minute, we, these, we should be preserving this. So you get what's called um, salvage anthropology, salvage, you know, um, you get people saying, no, 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 we need to preserve, you know, we, they do need to be making their traditional arts and crafts, their rugs, mostly so they can sell them. But yeah, it, at a certain point when, when they, when, when some white people say, oh, wait a minute, there is something here. Now, again, it's only when <laughs> it's only when it's um, not a threat and it's being preserved as a sort of an exotic feature. Jim, do you have a way to articulate this? Or <laughs> You know what I mean, though, about Loop and, and that whole Native American arts program. Oh. So to put it in a timeline, so by the 1890s, basically all of the the Native American tribes that had continued to fight for their own right to live their way, um, they've pretty much all been subdued. And, mm -hmm. and all you see of Western culture is sort of the Wild West shows. Um, and so it's at that point, just as you get into the turn of the century that you start seeing the anthropologists and ethnologists who are now trying to study these cultures and preserve them. And you start seeing people within the Bureau of Indian Affairs rise to positions of leadership that think there are some aspects of their cultures that should be preserved. And, and so as, as Kate was mentioning, uh, Francis Loop um, becomes Commissioner of Indian Affairs and they open a native um, arts and crafts studio at the Carlisle Indian School, and they hire um, a Native American artist, Angel Decora, who's who's Winnebago, to teach traditional uh, arts and crafts to the Native American students. Which you know, during Pratt's era, that never would have happened. They would only learn Western art, right? Because that was the antithesis of what he wanted. Yeah. Right. Um, and if I can interrupt, Jim, the book that I wanted to get off my shelf, this is a book called The Indian Craze, uh, Primitivism, Modernism and Transculturation in American Art, 1890 to 1915. Because, of course, you know, there became this this idea. It's like, oh, I should be collecting pottery and I should be, you know, white people became interested in Native American art and not in an educated way. But again, you know, this sort of Victorian bric-a-brac thing. So, you know, I, I collecting things as sort of curio curios. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, so there was an, an ethnologist and other people were trying to document the languages in some cases and cultures, but not in a sense that uh, these people should be returning to their traditional way of life. It was much more surface and, um, yeah. you know, I think a lot of it's around the pretty things like mm -hmm. pots and art. Again, it's very. It yeah. takes us hundreds of years sometimes to recognize the um, how wrong we've been. Yeah, but any idea yeah. that like Native American, um, you know, medicine had any value that you could pay attention to any of their stories about their histories, completely discounted. I, I right. think that's you know right. pretty pretty fair. So yeah, it was much more of a sort of a curatorial interest. Yeah. Almost. Yeah, like a passing fancy. Yeah. Although the native, the um, many of the Carlisle graduates actually became active in um, in lobbying for Native American rights. Good. And the Society Good. of American Indians and the sort of pan Indian movement um, was, there were a lot of Carlisle graduates who were active in that. So it did have that kind of an influence as well. And they, so they were, um, advocating for themselves. Good. And, good and one, of the other, one of the other positives that's always talked about from coming out of, of the boarding schools is the fact that um, people from different nations and tribes across the country started to see the things they had in common because they all always viewed themselves as different from one another. If, if mm -hmm. I'm and somebody else's Comanche, you know, we don't necessarily see ourselves as uh, having anything in common. We're, we're two totally different nations. Um, but with, um, with the fact that they were put together on these boarding schools, then they started to see um, common interests and, and that's how the pan-Indian movement is able to develop and, and they're able to work together toward shared goals and citizenship. I mean, they didn't even uh, have citizenship at, at that time. It's not until right. the 1920s that they uh, yeah. achieved that goal. So, um, and that probably would have taken even longer if not for their activism. Mm -hmm. Lou, we have a question. I have one question. I'm going to phrase it correctly. <clears throat> Do we, oh, are there memoirs or other histories or information left behind or imparted to us by the non Indian participants or teachers or workers um, or donors of the Carlisle boarding school, like let's say from the Quakers? Uh, I mean, that would be you know, as I said, Pratt wrote his memoir and it's it's all Pratt. Um, it's all Pratt all the time. Um, I, none, none of teachers, there are no, certainly no published memoirs of, I'm looking at Jim, I know there aren't, of other white people involved at Carlisle. I think there are a handful of memoirs of, of people who worked at other schools and certainly some of the um, commissioners of Indian Affairs, Loop uh, wrote, um, but but yeah, of Carlisle specifically, I'm not aware of other other teachers or employees of I don't, recording did, it. Um, and I don't think Angel Decora wrote a memoir herself, right? She I'm, was actually a Native American. Um, she was an artist, an important Native American female mm -hmm. artist who taught at Cart was brought in to teach Native American arts to Native at Americans Carlisle. at Carlisle. Yeah. So um, she did not. There's a very good biography of her. Uh, Angel Decora. Um, That's a shame. That would be an interesting viewpoint to have. Yeah, you know, she from died. Someone she, who she died relatively okay. young, and so she yeah. did not get a chance to do that. Well, this has been a fascinating study. Um, we're we're going to have to come back to this. You know, okay. there, there's a lot more here, as as we find with most of our topics. That uh, if you have recommendations, Kate, of books or things that we should um, delve into. If you can um, email either myself or Lou, we'll make sure to get it up on the YW site uh, because people often ask for recommendations of things to 
um, to, to, you know, for more information, yeah. books um, and things that they should take a look at? Yeah, definitely the documentary that's going to be shown uh, when we're recording yeah. this in two weeks on PBS. Jim, what's the name of it? I do have that. Oh, you, have, you have the name. Yeah, of it. I do have that. Deb provided that for us. It's um, called Home from School, The Children of Carlisle. And it'll be shown on WITF TV on Tuesday, November 23rd at 9 p.m. So, and um, it's um, it's the movie about the Carlisle Indian Boarding School. It's it's really um, about the repatriation of of one. I think it's actually one person or the the people the remains of one student. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's really about that emotional experience. Yes. Um, okay. So, so we can see there is a, uh, as you said, a private, um, uh, well, it was public um, uh, viewing of that show, uh, that that um, documentary, but it is sold out, I noticed today. Um, so it is now a private one, <laughs> you know, since it's sold out. Um, but the, this, um, this particular program um, has been funded in part by WITF, um, and a number of other local regional organizations. So, um, I, which I was really pleased to see there was a lot of regional interest in it. So, so that's really great. And they will be showing it then again, Tuesday, November 23rd over WITF TV. So check whatever cable or dish system you're on to find out how you it'll, get it'll, that. If you at your house. streaming, it'll be there all the time. It's oh yeah, time. that's that's even better because you know be where there. you find it. So, uh, yes, we will certainly send you um, a, a list of resources for people who are interested in following up. Um, you can, if you have a specific question, if you go to the Digital Resource Center site, um, there's a way you can ask a question, contact us and ask a question. Okay, we're always happy to follow up and answer questions. And I did get that e, um, that um, link from the very beginning of your, your slides so that we can post that as well to send people to, um, you know, to, to that website. A um, couple of announcements tonight before we close um, that Deb asked me to make sure to bring to your attention. The YW Hanover Upstanders, which is our teen um, active group, will be cleaning the streets again on Sunday, November 21st from 2 to 3.30. I, have, I need to talk to them about cleaning inside, see if I can, you know, what Get them over to your can, house, Lisa? Yeah, get, get them into the house, yeah. So uh, everybody is welcome to join it. This is a fantastic group of, of young people. Uh, and if you know of any middle school or high school students who are interested in becoming a member of the Un Upstanders, email Deb Smith at the ywcafhanover.org and her email uh, name is simply dsmith at ywcaofhanover.org. Our next enlightened conversation is not going to be until January. We're going to take December off, or we're going to try to anyway. Um, the topic will be poverty in Hanover, um, which, yes, it does exist. There are a number of, of uh, local residents, I think, who say, what, here? Yeah, here. So, and we're going to talk about that in uh, January on the 19th, January 19th. Well, we will have with us representatives from New Hope Ministry and the Hanover Area Council of Churches. We have a lot of things coming up in the spring, uh, which you can find at the YWCA of Hanover website. Lou always keeps that up to date. And um, we'll have some other enlightening conversations coming up after January as well. But mark the 19th of, of January on your calendar for our next conversation. And just a personal note before we close for the evening, um, this Saturday, November 13th, is National Kindness Day. I don't know if you were aware of that, but um, if you have a moment and you can remember from today till Till Saturday, which I realize it's difficult. It's hard for me anyway. Please try to keep in mind that um, that it's a national day to extend a moment of kindness to somebody else. And it's certainly something that's very much needed in today's world. So National Kindness Day, spread it around. So thank you all. We'll see you in January. Have a wonderful couple of weeks until then.
Good night. Thank you, everybody. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, um, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and have a wonderful day.